dropped, and it's showtime from downtown Winnipeg. Nice pass, a shot, they score! Shankly Cutter scores! What a stop by Hellebach! Nikolai Ehlers at the face off! Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, hosted by Jets TV. Well, hello there and welcome back to Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. It's been a few weeks since you heard from us, but it's been, uh, well, a few weeks uh, for the Winnipeg Jets as uh, we reach back to our last episode. The Jets weren't officially out of the playoffs, but uh, it happened, uh, I believe it was out in Carolina, is when the the nail in the coffin, uh, so to speak, was was hammered. Uh, The Jets losing four straight on the road, but then... Uh, you know, finish things off the right way on home ice, picking up four straight wins. And heck, two of those were against really quality opponents in, in the Colorado Avalanche and, and the Calgary Flames. And you throw in a couple of wins against the Philadelphia Flyers and uh, you close out the season against the Seattle Kraken with a come from behind win. I mean, if you're a Jets fan, given the situation, I understand you couldn't ask for a better way to close that out, I think. Anyway. Um, big show for you here today to close off the regular season uh, before we take a bit of a hiatus uh, and then go into sort of the summer mode of things uh, on the podcast. We'll talk about quite a bit. We'll talk about that week that was the four game win streak. Uh, Mitch will touch on that. And then uh, on Monday at Canada Life Center, Kevin Shoveldayov spoke to the media uh, about the end of season goings on and everything. So he gave a bit of an update. We'll hear from him uh, about bit of a comment on the coaching situation for the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, Jamie Thomas will break down that press conference. And then Mitch will give sort of his season takeaways. Could go many ways with that. Uh, and then in the middle of the show here, we don't have a specific guest, but uh, you'll hear from Blake Wheeler, Paul Stasny, Mark Shifley, Josh Morrissey, and Pierre-Luc Dubois. So those names are coming up later in the episode. And then uh, we'll talk about the unsung hero of the team. On the last episode, I asked Paul Edmonds that question. His mm-hmm. answer was Eric Comrie. So just FYI, that can't be... <laughs> it's crossed off the list. There has to be more than one. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, All right. And then this one's tough. I mean, Dennis Bayak stepping away as the play-by-play voice uh, on television for the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, we'll talk about him and what he meant to all of us in this room. I know we all valued his uh, camaraderie and friendship and, and everything in between uh, to do with that gentleman. So, uh, And then we'll let him close out the show with his message uh, to the viewers and fans uh, through TSN's uh, final program with him uh, as the big man. So great show for you today. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, lots to talk about. But so first, the week in review. Let's wash away the tough four-game road losing streak. Although two really good efforts in New York and Carolina just couldn't finish it out. I mean, those are two really good teams as well. But the Colorado Avalanche, the Philadelphia Flyers, the Calgary Flames, and Seattle Kraken all hit the road with L's. Uh, Mitch, just what did you see from the team in the final week as they finished off on the right note? I would say I saw pride. That's probably the biggest thing that can come out of that. And I think that was pretty much the expectation from... Um, I think within the room, that's kind of what they expected out of themselves. And I mean, to, to start it off with a win over the, the Colorado Avalanche, a team that, you know, had kind of had your number for most of the season, with the exception of uh, the one game earlier in the month at Canada Life Center where uh, the Avs won 5-4 in overtime. The Jets, nice little comeback in that game. Um, so it, that's how you want to get the, the homestand started, especially, like you said, you were officially eliminated, you know, in Carolina. So this is kind of your first ish game kind of coming out of that elimination. And you, you come out and you beat the Colorado avalanche four to one. That's solid. And then a really, a really big night for Eric Comrie, a couple of nights later, getting his first career NHL shutout. I think it's interesting because with about five, six, seven minutes left in the third period, you know, we kind of come down from the press box to get ready to do the post game show. And so we're watching it on a screen instead of watching it live. And, so you're, you're able to kind of cheer for guys a little bit more, you know? And like I guess with every save Comrie made, you're just like, hey, come on, come on. You're watching the clock. You're like, he's been close before. You just want him to get it so bad. And then for it to happen, especially with a penalty kill late in the game, um, I think was really awesome. And then, yeah, you go, you go and you beat the Calgary Flames. You end up winning the season series against that club. Um, you know, it's just kind of continued, uh, continued momentum. You give up the first goal in that game. I think it's the only time on the homestand they did that. Uh, and they rallied back for a, for a 3-1 win over a, a really good Calgary Flames team. 
And to that point in the homestand, you've beaten two of the top teams in the West. So, I mean, like you said uh, in the intro there, Tyler, I mean, you're beating some really quality teams on this homestand and you don't have, you know, someone like Mark Shifley in the lineup either. Obviously he was close to returning. He was in non-contact by the end of the week, but ultimately not enough uh, runway left in the season. And then, yeah, the Seattle Kraken game. I mean, obviously we, you touched on Dennis Bayak. I just thought it was good that, you know, the team came out in that third period and I, Kevin Sawyer said this on the post game show and I, I agree with him. You know, there's part of the team that I think came out and said, all right, this is our last 20 minutes. We're going to, you know, show the fans, you know, the, we have no quit in our room. We've got pride in what we do. But he likes to believe, and I tend to believe it too, they they gave a little extra for, for Dennis Bayak up there, make sure he goes out with a win and gets to say bang, bang, and then got to say bang, bang, bang because they yes. scored three in the third period uh, to make it a 4-3 win. So, I mean, like you said, it's it, there's disappointment around the, the group for, for not making it to the Stanley Cup playoffs for the fifth straight year. But... If you're going to end a season in which you're not going to the playoffs, that would be the way you'd want to end it. Absolutely. And Kyle Connor, 47 goals on the year. I mean, there's lots to like about this group going forward. Uh, okay, so before we talk to Jamie about his thoughts on Kevin Sheveldayov's final press conference of the season, uh, here's a comment from the, head co- or from the general manager about the state of the coaching staff. Uh, and he uses the term, uh, first of all, he did not fire anybody, so there's no yeah. firing, there's no parting of ways. None of that, but there is a full-scale interview process that is about to take place uh, for a new head coach of the Winnipeg Jets. Here is that clip from Kevin now. So I met, um, uh, you know, late in the evening uh, after, uh, you know, everything had kind of uh, died down. I met with all the coaches. Um, So I informed them that um, we're going to be conducting a uh, a full-scale interview process for a, a new head coach. And um, so I met with each of uh, them individually. I met with Dave and, and uh, you know, told him that as well and, and said to him uh, if he wanted to be part of, of that uh, formal search that uh, he had earned that opportunity. So, um, you know, we will grant him a, a formal interview process uh, in, in that regard. I met with all the assistant coaches as well and told them that, um, you know, again, we're going to go through this process and that uh, there's a, a chance that uh, they're, you know, part of that process moving forward when we finally select uh, a head coach, but there's also a chance that it might not be there. All right, Jamie, uh, you heard Kevin Shevelyov just there speak, and uh, you were in the room for the press conference mm-hmm. at noon on Monday. Just your thoughts on what the general manager had to say on, on a wide variety of topics. Well, you know, clearly he made sure to confirm no one was fired on the coaching staff. There's just a long evaluation going on here. Dave Lowry will be given an opportunity to interview for the head coaching job. And when it comes to assistance, if it's a new head coach, Maybe though the current assistant coaches will be given an opportunity if that turns out that way. So there's no firing. That's we have to be clear about that one. And Kevin Shevelldale did a good job clarifying that. He also clarified Mark Shifley hadn't asked for a trade yet. He also talked about one thing. Another thing that kind of stuck out there is he just heard a lot of passion. He's been listening to everyone talk. It's been a long post mortem, dragged out. Um, but I feel the way the Jets PR has handled this. A little bit here, a little bit there, rather than everybody today um, after their post-season uh, meetings with the general manager of the Winnipeg Jets. That's Kevin Sheveldayoff. So he understands where it is an emotional time for everybody. And I, I feel that he feels that there wasn't a lot of finger pointing, but it's everybody's upset about the end goal not being what they were hoping for. So, And then on top of that, um, mentioned he had a very candid conversation with Pierre-Luc Dubois, uh, he said it was interesting and refreshing and getting perspective after a full year with the organization. So the business side of that, and that's the contract, uh, the extension for Pierre-Luc Dubois uh, will have to take care of itself. Um, also, players have been questioning culture. That's not the, that he was asked about that. And I liked what he said. Culture is a very broad word, which is used a lot. Culture comes with a core set of beliefs. Culture just doesn't happen overnight. So there's been a lot of things said about the players or from the players about what didn't happen this year. Um, but Kevin Sheveldoff wrapped it up nicely there. You just can't throw the worm culture out there and say, this is how it's going to work. It just doesn't work that way. And also pointing out the fact, Zach Stanford played for the St. Louis Blues in 2019. Kind of asked him what turned things around for them. In January, they were in last place. They ended up winning the Stanley Cup. And Zach Sanford didn't really have an answer because there is no way to clarify what exactly went right. Just guys started playing a lot better. Things started, and the team melded together. It's just really hard to sit there and ask somebody flat out, how are we going to fix this? Or how does this, how do you turn things around? 
it's just a long process and things just went the right way for the St. Louis Blues. So I just felt Shovel Day off handled things and answered things the best way he could. It's been a tough year for everybody, um, but uh, clearly there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes that have to be looked at and on the ice and off the ice for this organization to take the step forward rather than one they took backward this, this past season. Uh, before we get into Mitch's thoughts on the season and his takeaways, just a quick reminder, the Manitoba Moose, they're in the playoffs, and uh, heck, they got a really good young squad. Uh, they go up against the Milwaukee Admirals to get things going in the Calder Cup playoffs. The first two games, it's a five-game series. The first two are down in Milwaukee. Uh, you can watch those games on AHL TV, I believe, and, of course, you can listen on 680 CGOB. Jamie, are they carrying those games? They absolutely are, okay, yes. That would make that, sense. That, that, it does. But the exciting part about that is uh, they'll be playing here at Canada Life Center uh, for games 3, 4, and 5. That's how it works in the AHL. Uh, May 11th, 13th, and 15th, those games go, so they got a couple of days spaced out between each one, uh, 7 p.m., 7 p.m., and the 2 p.m. game, if necessary, on the Sunday, so uh, get your tickets now. Uh, when it, when it pay jets. <laughs> com. Oh, wow, uh, moose ho- moose dot com slash tickets and uh, get your seats for those. It should be very exciting. To see uh, some some young Jets prospects in that lineup too. So uh, don't want to miss that. So uh, go moose, go. Mitch, uh, your takeaways from the season. I mean, there's so many different ways you could go with this, and you mentioned it in your first answer. This is the first year in five seasons that the Jets missed the playoffs. And, you know, there's disappointment there. But at the same time, when the Jets would miss the playoffs before, the sentiment was a little bit different. Now it's disappointment, but that doesn't mean good things aren't on the horizon. Yeah, and, like, it's it's interesting because, and I was thinking about this earlier in the day, just the simple fact that you look at, you know, Pierre-Luc Dubois gets a career high in goals. Uh, Josh Morrissey's got a career high in points and goals as well. Uh, career high, obviously, for Kyle Connor, who had just a sensational hockey season, finishing with 93 points, sets a couple of franchise records. He had so many career bests, and yet for whatever reason, it just didn't come together. Um, so I think one of the takeaways that, that you have is just the fact that, you know, clearly there are some really good performers on this club that, you know, that lots of things, lots of really good things to build around. And I mean, you know, one of the guys that I mentioned there in Kyle Connor is someone that's locked up for a number of years. And, you know, you don't think that guys don't want to play with Kyle Connor. Like, come on, like that's, that's, that is absolutely where you would want to be if you're any player. Um, so certainly I think Kyle Connor's uh, growth would be one of the biggest takeaways. And, and it's not even necessarily that he, you know, changed anything or whatever. He just found another level that he said, you know, you work for these things. He's not popping champagne, like he said the other day, for his own personal results because he puts in the work. And now he's got this, you, you can't tell me that going into next year, yes, you're going to take it one game at a time. Yes, you're going to want to win games, number one. But you can't tell me that after scoring 47, he's not thinking, okay, there's three more in there. There's at least three well, more I mean, <laughs> Having COVID there. Yeah, exactly. Just yeah, 100%. A real kick in the pants. Yeah, so there's that. And then I think also the emergence of some players, like Cole Perfetti gets his first NHL experience this year, you know, plays in his first NHL game, and then goes down to the Moose for a little while, comes back, and then... You know, was pick, great. Exactly. And in, in roles that you would like to see him in. You know, he plays with Kyle Connor and Pierre-Luc Dubois, and those three really seem to to form a chemistry. So I think there was that. A uh, guy like Dylan Sandberg comes in, gets his first NHL action, and doesn't look out of place in any way, shape, or form. You also got to look at some other guys, like Declan Chisholm comes in and gets his first NHL game. And I mean, I, I thought he was sensational in, in Detroit. And then he also played a little bit later in the season as well. And Jonathan Kovacevic as well. Like, I mean, the list goes on. I think it was six. NHL debuts this year and you really got to look at some of your prospects at that level. Billy Hainla again took I think another step. Four of them year. drafted. Exactly and that's the other part too is obviously this development pipeline is working um, so I think that's a really good thing to see uh, from the group. So yeah and then obviously your, your, your final takeaway if you will is yes this is going to be a bitter pill to swallow but I really think just given how these athletes think, regardless of what happens off season wise, the the players that are back, the people that are back for, you know, the, the start of training camp and you get into the next season, 
there's going to be a chip on the shoulder of absolutely every single person that was, you know, here this season and, and also here for next season. And I think that's going to be something that's going to drive this team more than anything else. So I think those are probably the three things that I take away from this year. Yeah, you mentioned chip on the shoulder, and I kind of, and you also talked about it, Jamie, in mm-hmm. your answer how Jets PR has handled this. I think after the Jets were eliminated, it was sort of this postmortem feel to yeah. every yeah. single media availability, and then sort of things were just sort of said like, "Hey, if this is how it's going to be," which fair enough, then we're not doing everybody on mm-hmm. locker cleanout day like they like to call it. So it's been good, and I think. Nobody's words are getting lost here, and I think everything that's being said, because it's sort of being said one day at a time, is it's having more impact. And I think you can really tell, to use Chevy's word, passion in this group uh, and and just not settling for where things are at right now. Uh, Okay, speaking of some of those voices, Blake Wheeler, uh, Paul Stasny, Mark Scheifele, Josh Morrissey, and Pierre-Luc Dubois, they all talk about sort of just the season coming to an end. I've included the questions from the media member who asked it as well, so thanks to them for uh, for helping us out with this as well. Uh, Paul Stasny's question is the only one that doesn't really fit the theme. His is more about the future of his career at 36 years of age, and hey, uh, the guy had, you know, 20 plus goals for the first time went like six years so yeah. uh not bad uh good for him and uh, 800 career points too so uh that's enough from us you'll hear from these guys now like i know you spoke pretty openly when you guys got eliminated but do you have an overall thought on the season and the maybe the importance heading into the off season for your group yeah i think it's uh yeah it's just disappointing you know i don't think there's any anyone that can be very proud of their performance this year, um, collectively as a group, you know, we uh, we weren't able to to figure it out. Um, you know, I said all year, and I still believe this that there's a good hockey team in there. I think Paul alluded to it a little bit right there. Uh, you know, like that our particular line combination. You know, too little, too late. But you just you start to you start to wonder. You know, uh, what could have been, and um, you know, it's. The onus is on us as players. You know, at the end of the day, it's it's our responsibility to, you know, continue to trend in the direction we've been trending, and um, we took a step back this year. Paul, even a free agent before, what are the priorities for you going into the off season in terms of finding a fit, and, and is Winnipeg still a consideration on that side of things? Yeah, I mean, right now for me, just I think I take a vacay with the wife. <laughs> it's been two and a half years since we've gotten away from the kids, but uh, no, I've always said. I kind of, everything's always on the table. I've learned to keep an open mind. I think uh, you just never know whether, you don't know who the coaches are going to be, who management is going to be, who's making trades. So you kind of want to stay aware for that. And, and you obviously want to go somewhere. As you get older, you don't have as, um, you know, when I was 20, yeah, it's free agent. It was different. Now that older, you don't have as many teams interested. But you just hope there's teams interested and then you go from there. But, um, I've said it before, and because and, and I've been through it, it's easier for me to kind of just wait it out as long as I can and just kind of see, I think, take a couple of weeks off now to kind of let everything settle. Um, you know, if the body feels good, if I can keep playing, then, you know, that's what I want to do. And then, uh, you know, want the family to be happy. I think want the fit to be happy, but kind of all kind of options are on the table, and I don't close the door anywhere I've been. Mark, there were obviously big expectations going into this season, and you guys started off nine three and three at one point. Um, where did it go wrong from there, in your eyes? You know, I think it's hard to really pinpoint one one specific time. It was just kind of you know little 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 bad spurts that you know turned into end up being you know monumental things to to overcome, and um, it's one of those. You know, years that you know you you know, kind of look back on, and some of it's a blur, some of it's really clear, and um, you know, it's definitely a year I I I'll try to forget a little bit. It was a it was a, it was a tough one, and um, you know, from a lot of things, COVID injuries, you know, a coach leaving, a new coach coming in, all the you know all that stuff. Um, you know, losing yeah Olympics, I forgot about that already. So. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it was a, it was it was a tough year. COVID, all that all that stuff. It's 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 one of those years that, you know, it sucked, and you know, it's a it's a crappy ending. But you know, like I said before, you can't dwell on it too long. You gotta you gotta reflect and and uh, you know think about you know the good and the bad and and the ugly. And 
and, and come back better next year. Do you believe that this could just be a one-off and, and that this group is kind of currently constructed, that there's, there's a playoff team and maybe a championship team kind of within this group? Or um, are you kind of bracing maybe for bigger changes as a result of the way this season played out? Well, I think, uh, you know, first of all, where we're at right now is um, a disappointment for sure. And, you know, it's been said, um, you know, throughout the last uh, week with the various media availabilities. I mean, it's a, you know, an underachievement in my in my view. And I think most guys in the room share the same opinion. Um, you know, I think when you see the, I've listed a few of the interviews from guys this last week. I mean, you know, when you watch, you hear the way guys speak, everyone cares. Everyone is not happy with where we're at. Um, you know, I do think that our team and the team in that locker room, um, you know, we have a we have a playoff caliber team. We have a team that can win. And, um, you know, I think any moves, things like that that happen, you know, we, we underachieved and make the playoffs. So uh, as a player, you have to understand that. I don't know what's going to happen. As you said, I'm not, not a GM. Um, but I think if we just say oh, it's a one-off, you know, we'll come back next year and be, you know, the team that we think we should be, it's not going to happen. So, um, you know, I think now we've talked, you know, a lot about it. We'll have more conversations in the next few days, and um, you know, there's hopefully guys go into the off season uh, motivated and ready to work. And and uh, you know, again. I wouldn't even say hopefully because I know from speaking to the guys that's where we're at. You know, we're disappointed, we're frustrated, we're, um, you know, mad about the way that it's gone. And uh, the only guys that can right the ship, uh, you know, are the players. So um, that's really the focus going into the off season, I think. And um, you know, I think we can look at a team like we're playing tonight. You know, they had an off year last year, missed the playoffs. Um, you know, from obviously being from Calgary here and a lot of the way that the guys have spoke on their team, media, whatnot, you know, they didn't just say oh, it was a one-off and, you know, we'll be good next year. They clearly put the work in and, um, you know, have come in and, and obviously found great success. So um, that's, I think, what, you know, our goal should be is to be able to replicate that. And uh, But it's going to take hard work and, and uh, you know, obviously a, a big off-season um, you know, to, to be able to do that and, and not just complacency thinking it'll just happen. Um, you've come out after, you know, lots of games this season and, and you know, been very open about um, your play and the team's play. I mean, now with just these two games left, um, I don't know how much time you've had to kind of take stock of the season as a whole yet, but uh, how would you categorize this season? Uh, it's a disappointing year. I mean, Whenever you don't make the playoffs, even if you're, you know, a team that's scratching you, or at the beginning of the year, your objective is to, you know, try as much as you can. Any any team in the NHL that doesn't make the playoffs, it's a disappointment. Um, and I've said it before, even when you lose second round like last year, it's it's a disappointment. Um, nobody plays to to make the playoffs, or nobody plays to lose in the second or even third round. I mean, you you play to win the cup. And for us this year. Um, you know, the the team. I think with the team we had, and and you know, I'm not gonna come out here and say we we're gonna win the Stanley Cup. You know, but you never know. And I think when you look at teams, we're one of those teams that at the beginning of the year we felt like we did have a chance to win the Cup. And you know, you never know when it's gonna be your year. But we had a lot of talent. Felt like we had a lot of the pieces to to make a run for it and to you know to to get as far as we could and to not make the playoffs and. You know, be eliminated with like six games left. Um, it's frustrating and it's it's very very disappointing. Shop where the players shop. Jets Gear and TrueNorthShop.com are your authentic team stores. Make sure to stock up on all your favorite Winnipeg Jets and Manitoba Moose merchandise today. Visit one of the five Jets Gear locations or shop online at TrueNorthShop.com. Hi, this is Eric Comrie, and you're listening to Ground Control the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. Rolling right along in episode 134 of Ground Control. Um, can we just talk about the last guest on this podcast, Chris Kravyazic? Uh <laughs> He was awesome. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. He's uh, really good. He just 
he knows how to spin a tail and have some conversational elements. So uh, it was a lot of fun to talk to him, and I hope the fans learned something. I always, you know, we get a front row seat to sort of every little intricacy that goes into having an NHL team run, and I'm always fascinated by everybody else's jobs except yes. my own half yeah. the time. <laughs> and his is, his is one of those unique ones where, like, you know, at face value, you're like, okay, whatever, he books the buses and flights. But, like, there's just so many little things involved. So it's I hope when things go wrong. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. Like they did a lot this year. When it comes to travel and yeah. stuff, yeah. 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 Anyway, thanks to Krev for the time. That was great. Uh, okay, rolling right along. Unsung heroes for both of you. Uh, who wants to go first? Well, I could go first. The problem is... Paul Edmonds took who would have been mine, which is Eric Comrie. I mm-hmm. just think a guy finishes with with ten wins this year, gets his first NHL shutout, and I think over the course of his last few starts, he had something like a nine fifty eight save percentage. It was unbelievable. Um, so I think Eric Comrie for a guy that you know had the opportunity to come in and be a backup for the first time in his NHL career, he finishes the season with a nine twenty save percentage, two fifty eight goals against. I mean. He did absolutely everything to prepare for this in terms of, you know, speaking with a with a, like a sports psychologist in the off season to prepare. And then every time you talk to him after the game, so much of it was just, you know, I just handled what I could control, stayed focused on a couple of key things, and then just, you know, did what I had to do. And I really think that helped calm down a lot of parts of his game. Because I think back to his first NHL start, which was in Columbus, and the Jets get the win that night, so that's good. But, I mean, I could just imagine being in that position and how nervous I would be. And then for a goaltender, when you're nervous, it just seems like everything's jittery and you're not calm, you're not big and boring, as Connor Hellebuck likes to mm-hmm. say, right? So um, I just felt this year Eric Comrie just seems so comfortable in who he was as a goaltender, how he plays the game. And it's not like you can say the guy, you know, never put in the work. He's the first guy on the ice. He's the last guy off the ice. And he's facing every single shot or situation that you can imagine in that probably 90 minute span that he's on the ice every single day for practice. So I just, yeah. It's I thought hard. I said he's not allowed to be the unsung hero. <laughs> I'm sorry, but like, <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'm going to go with Eric Comrie. But if I had to pick somebody else, I might have to go with uh, Brandon Dillon. And the reason for that is he finishes second in terms of plus minus on the team. And, you know, people can say what they want about plus minus, but uh, I think, I think there's still some value to it in the, in the player's eyes. So for him, it's the second highest plus minus he's had in his career. I think the only other time it was like 2018, 19 with Washington, he was a couple points higher. But other than that, you know, he, he's a guy that just came in super nice guy. Great to talk to first guest on this first uh, guest. On, on yes, exactly. And, he was just excellent in terms of that. And then on the ice, I mean, I remember there were a number of nights where teams would come into uh, into Canada Life Center and it would be like, Brendan Dillon would throw a hit and you'd be like, oh, that Brendan Dillon, it's him again. Yes. Yeah. And then to have him on your team, it's just he was so solid no matter what deep pairing he was on. He, had, he played his offside at certain points yeah. this year and never really, like, you didn't hear a peep out of him really about anything being – you know, something that he couldn't handle or anything like that. Played his 700th game a little bit earlier this year. Uh, I just think he was everything that the Winnipeg Jets could have hoped for when they brought him in and just fit right in on that blue line. And I just think it was, he had a, a really good season. Brendan Dillon is uh, featured in Flight Path. Uh, you can find that on winnipegjets.com slash video. Uh, check that out as well. His dad was in there. Apparently his dad was super pumped to be interviewed mm-hmm. for yes. that piece. So uh, enjoy. It, it was really good. Uh, Jamie, who, who's the man for you? Uh, Paul Stastny, a okay. flat out. And that probably, I, I go along with Mitch, like Eric Comrie is such an obvious unsung hero because of the, of the backup situation and how he handled it this year, his first full year of doing that. But Paul Stastny, because I think a lot of people are like, oh, he's going to get dealt to the deadline because the Jets didn't look like they were in that place where they wanted to be at that time. But all he did afterwards was one of the best face-off guys. Wherever you needed him to go, wing, center, he would do it. He killed penalties on the power play. And then on top of that, him, Blake Wheeler, and Nikolai Ehler seemed to find something special towards the end of the year. And Blake Wheeler alluded to it yesterday that there it was almost like you're thinking of what might have been had they been put together earlier. So, And I, I just think... He was a great quote, and then the one thing that kind of stuck out to me and put him right in that that unsung hero, we have to have more respect for each other, flat out. 
like that's just, that that's talking about player to player within the dressing room. So, uh, great leader, um, great player, and the, congratulations on the fact that he got the twenty goals for the first time since he like left Colorado, which I found yeah. just shocking. Just, yeah, really. Yeah, just a great player all around and just so smart and. Uh, I think a little bit underrated in some aspects, so he's my pick for the unsung hero of this club, hockey club. You mentioned uh, not trading him at the deadline. Yeah. Um, with Mark Scheifele going down in the final stretch of the season, yeah. could have been uh, a tough test for that uh, forward group yeah. uh, yes. had they traded him. So uh, a great job. Uh, kudos to, to all those who had really good career years uh, for the Winnipeg Jets. All right, that's enough about the hockey. There's mm-hmm. lots to come. There's the draft. What else do we got? Free, Free agency. agency. Yeah. Uh, there's that fishing with the Jets thing. Yes, there is that. I'm going, I, as far as I know. That'll yeah. be cool. So get some fishing content. And then what do we got? Any You're holding a camera the whole time for that, are you not? Like, are you going to get in shots? Of, are you doing well, that part of I'm it? I'm just hoping I don't drop it in the water. Are you fishing, though? You know, if there, if I didn't put a hook in the water, I feel like it'd be a little weird. Right. Yeah. They just kind of look at you as the guy with the camera. You got at least like I like it. fishing. So see, I'm, I get golf because you can. You're moving. You're, the, the scenery changes a lot. You, oh, and then the boat. You're like I don't even know why we like each other. <laughs> <laughs> I've often thought the same thing. <laughs> like I get golf, but like fishing is a you, long time to sit in that one hilarious. spot. Yeah. But that's I guess you go different characters. You can make a lot of fun. Maybe I haven't gone fishing with the right people. That's probably what it is. Paul Evans should invite you out. He would, yeah. he would make sure you had a great time. That's a good point. I wouldn't have Zinger will invite me one of these times. Probably. I feel like <laughs> now that could be a cool piece of content is just filming Jamie fishing, knowing full in well the, that he just despises in, the activity. And I hate bugs. So. <laughs> and he hates bugs. Okay. Uh, that's so look for that. Yes, yeah, that's coming. <laughs> and, well, and just Jamie too. Thomas being miserable. That's <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Dennis Bayak. Uh Sort of quickly announced uh, with a few games left that this was going to be his last year on the mic uh, on TSN for the Winnipeg Jets. Um, I, I mean, I'll start. I, I, it was hard to sort of take that. And I only say that because, you know what, like doing what we do, we sort of get a front row seat to the behind the scenes things. It's it's the dinners. It's the bus rides. uh and you got to watch that man live and work mm-hmm. uh, in in what he did best, and he did it with class. He's just so, like you got you list. Sorry, you folks that are listening all read the tweets, the comments, everything about Dennis, and, and it's all true. He's the best, and I've known Dennis since 2012 when I was an intern at, at TSN 1290. And uh, quick story, he. I was, you know, some no-name intern. But then he named me Taylor. <laughs> yes. And I entered there, I think it was like a two, or it was a three-week thing. And the whole time, he would come in and say, hey, Taylor. And me, I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm not going to correct the man. <laughs> like, <laughs> Absolutely. He's not. a legend. You would actually go and change your name legally. Yes. Is the proper uh, way it was, I had that lined up at some sort of office. But anyway, um, I remember telling my mom and dad, and they're like, oh, just just gonna go with it like don't worry about it and then i guess somebody at the station got wind that he was calling me the wrong name uh and then they let him know and then there was sort of like a a christmas dinner because it was leading into the christmas holiday and i got invited and i ended up sitting beside dennis and his wife bev and the whole taylor tyler thing came up and his wife ended up giving me heck for not telling him <laughs> off. And it's it's hilarious because we still talk about that all the time. And it's been, you know, 10 years since that since that time. So uh, amazing period of, of my life to be able to work with him and see him every day during the hockey season. So a, a dear friend, and he will be missed. Uh, I'll hand it over to you guys. Mitch? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I was lucky because when I started with the team in November of 2013, like... Dennis was maybe one of the only people that I knew, and, and it was only because I had kind of crossed paths with him a couple of times, but it wasn't anything, you know, long or permanent or anything. Um, but I knew of him, and he knew of me, I think, or at least knew my face. So uh, one of the things was he was always, like, extremely welcoming, especially, like, and you guys know sometimes coming into a job like this where you're, especially if you're joining partway through the year or you're just kind of joining and everything's just happening and you're, you just kind of feel like you're, 
in this um, almost like a roller coaster that's going and you're just jumping in and you don't really know what's coming. He was uh, he was really good about just being like, okay, you know, this kind of how this works, how this works. And um, I was lucky that over the number of years that uh, that I've now been with the team is I've sat across the aisle from him on the plane every road trip and just so legitimately a front row seat to see how he prepares for whether it's broadcasts or, or anything that you're having him do, whether it's with, you know, true North at gala dinners or whatever it may be, how prepared he is at all times. And, you know, it would be one thirty in the morning or something and we'd be on, we'd be flying to another city and he'd pull out that big black binder, open it up and he oh, yeah. would have everything just organized in such a way that he would be able to do prep as quickly and efficiently as possible and then yet still have time to come up with, and I remember there'd be a number of times on the flight where he'd reach over and he'd tap me and he'd be, and he'd rattle off some stat that, you know, no game note could ever pick up because he just has this encyclopedic knowledge of everything that had happened throughout the year. So, um, yeah, like you said, Tyler, I was, it was, it was a shock and it was, it was sad because I mean, that's a guy that I think can still call a, a real, real good hockey game. And thankfully, we're going to be able to hear his voice on some international competitions for the next little bit. That's that was a, a bit of a relief, but you know, not seeing him every day and just you know talking about this, that, or the other thing, um, it's going to be different when next year starts and you know he's not here every day. And it's going to be unfortunate. I'm just glad that he had the the moment that he so rightfully deserved uh, in the building with yeah. the, the standing ovation and everything. And I just thought uh, I just thought that was probably one of the best ways to for everyone to say thank you for everything that he's done uh not only in winnipeg but just over his career um i guess kind of piggybacking off what you said mitch one thing when you sit beside dennis on the plane you talk about that black binder as soon as we get on the plane he's going to the next destination he's got it open he's working on the next game and you almost feel guilty because i like to watch movies yeah, i, I like to listen to podcasts <laughs> i like to take a break yeah and then there's dennis whipping out the the old binder getting ready for the the, the next game up so and then just, I knew this year the game calling game in Seattle was important to him, and yeah. it, it was cool to be there with him for that um, because of his, his tie to the Seattle Thunderbirds, the Western Hockey League, and then just hearing all his great stories about things that happened when he was a general manager in the WHL, and yeah. that was the one thing is you could ask Dennis at any time about anything, and he would talk about it and not have any not big time you say I'm too busy or whatever, any question you would ask him, he would hang out and, and, and spend that time with you about it. And, I'll, and the one thing before I came here, I will always remember uh, the Wednesday night game against Toronto when it was Austin Matthews versus Patrick Laine for the first time. And that call on the radio was yes. elite. That is the most elite call. Uh, uh, you know, I've Paul Edmonds has got some great calls, but that one, that one with Dennis, I should stay is stands out for me because uh, it was before I even came here. I'm like, okay, that's, I knew Des a little bit when he was with the Edmonton Oilers. I knew a little bit of him about the, with the Toronto Maple Leafs, but uh, that was his, to me, one of his top calls here uh, for the Jets. You I, know, remember, the, I remember oh. when he went on NHL Network after that. Mm-hmm. This always stands out. Uh, he was interviewed, and um, they played that call, and like the person that was hosting was like, what do you think of that, Dennis? And Dennis goes, well, that guy needs to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis always good for a one-liner yeah. as well. Uh, the one thing I won't miss about Dennis is he loves, the, and you too, mm-hmm. love the window open on the plane. Yeah. Yes, it's time yeah. to rest. Dennis, like, Dennis and I like sunlight. It's so funny because... Everybody else in the Jets is our, our vampires, just so you guys know. The they, plane will take off from Winnipeg midday. Everybody after once the plane's in the air, everybody shuts the windows and gets a little shut eye, myself included. <laughs> well, Dennis and Jamie, they don't shut the windows. Dude, so I'm like fifty, I don't nap anymore. <laughs> so, oh, and he always makes a big deal out of it, and we always make a big deal out of it uh, yeah. back the other way. So, uh, but anyway, uh, congratulations to Dennis. You called your own shot, my man, and he gave us three bang, bang, bangs to uh, mm-hmm. to close it out. So, uh, an amazing career. Kudos to you. Uh, Thank you all for listening to Ground Control this season. Uh, it's been a, a great year in, for the podcast, I think. We got this new studio. Yes. Um, it is elite. It's pretty sweet. Uh, maybe we'll put a picture out on Twitter. We need to get some like branding on the wall or something. <laughs> Make it's it quite there. we got to paint now. it first. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, thank you so much for listening uh, each and every episode. Uh, you'll still hear from us uh, throughout the, the off season. I'm sure there'll be some, uh, well, I mean, there are 
doing this head coaching search. So I'm sure that'll call for an episode at some point. The draft, free agency, uh, there's lots to come uh, from us. And heck, maybe some uh, players from the World Championships Who knows? will join us. Uh, you never know. So uh, on behalf of us, thank you so much. Uh, and now to close things out, Dennis Back closes the show with his comments uh, and closing monologue on yesterday's broadcast. And as we say goodbye here, there are a number of people I do want to thank, starting with my lovely wife, Bev. For 43 years, she has been along with me for this journey that has allowed a farm kid from Rice Lake, Manitoba, 10 minutes from Winnipegosis, a half an hour from Dauphin, to chase his hockey dreams. It has been a terrific career, and I do thank Bev for being with me for so much of it. A number of other people, Mark Chippen, the who runs this Winnipeg Jets organization, the True North organization, the umbrella of the Winnipeg Jets in particular, the players, the coaches, the training staff, the medical staff, the communication staff, all of it is so much appreciated. Paul Graham of TSN, who in June of 2011 gave me a phone call and said, would you move to Winnipeg? And the immediate answer was yes. And it has been a terrific 11 years. I said this earlier, I realized the passion this city had for this hockey club right off the hop. And that has been very, very special for, for a Manitoba farm kid to come back and, and finish the career here. Edmonton will always be special. That was my first NHL gig. The 13 years in Toronto, Toronto's the hub of, of hockey, just ask them, I guess. But they are, everything happens. The National Hockey League office is there. But coming back here and being able to finish it was absolutely special. To the TSN crew, everybody that works behind the scenes. On television, you see myself, you see Sarah Orleski, a terrific broadcaster, a terrific friend. You see Kevin Sawyer now. You see all the people that have gone through as part of our broadcast. But without the people behind the scenes, none of that would happen. So many have become true friends over the years, and I thank each and every one of them. And without them, the broadcast would be, would be just way different. The fans, the viewers, without you, this game is nothing. And I appreciate all the support I have gotten over the years. You have welcomed me, you have welcomed my bang bangs and my Johnny Cash walk the line and round post, round puck, hit it square. And you have been so supportive throughout the 11 years since I've been here. So to the fans and the viewers, thank you very, very much. And one more note, in my opinion, plus a buck 65 will get you a small coffee at Tim's. There are a lot of good people in that Winnipeg Jets dressing room. There are a lot of good players in that Winnipeg Jets dressing room. Don't give up on this group. Winnipeg Jets defeat the Seattle Kraken. And for one final time, goodbye from Winnipeg. This is Big Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, hosted by Jets TV. For Jets news, videos, and more, head to WinnipegJets.com. Proceeding with Able.